the collective license idea doesn't really pay attention to uh, is that we're talking about billions of works. We're talking about billions of authors. We're talking about, um, about a lot of things that essentially have no commercial value, but how is some collecting society supposed to figure out, you know, here's 25 cents to you, here's 35 cents to you, here's a nickel to you. Um, There's just no metric, right? Hello, and welcome to this podcast. Today, it's my pleasure to welcome Professor Samuelson. Professor Samuelson is a Richard M. Sherman Distinguished Professor of Law and Information at Berkeley and the Director of the internationally renowned Berkeley Center for Law and Technology. She is recognized as a pioneer in digital copyright law, intellectual property, cyber law, and information policy. Professor Samuelson is also co-founder and chair of the board of Authors Alliance, a nonprofit organization that promotes the public interest in access to knowledge. She also serves on the board of directors of the Electronic Frontier Foundation, as well as on the advisory board for the Electronic Privacy Information Center, the Center for Democracy and Technology, and Public Knowledge. Professor Samuelson has written and published extensively in the areas of copyright, software protection, and cyber law, with recent publications looking into the possible intersections of generative AI and copyright. Let's hear what Professor Samuelson has to say. Normally, I ask in my first question uh, for a summary of an article or blog post, but in your case, the submission you made with Christopher John Sprigman and Matthew Sag uh, to the US Copyright Office consultation on AI is so detailed and it covers so many aspects uh, of AI and copyright that I propose to delve into specific issues uh, you raised. And the first one is actually pertinent to the current uh, European AI Act debates as it relates to transparency about copyrighted works included in training data. Uh, And your submission uh, points out that many AI researchers would face significant practical obstacles in complying with an obligation to collect, retain, and disclose records sufficient to allow copyright, sorry, copyright owners to determine whether their works have been used in the course of developing a machine learning or AI model. So can you share some of the difficulties that you foresee uh, if they were asked to do that? So one thing that actually motivates me is that the questions the Copyright Office asked and the, the issues that the AI regulators in the EU have been focused on really assume that there are these relatively few large entities that are uh, developing models and that are making um, uh, their generative AI products available in the marketplace. And um, there are a couple of reasons why that is not necessarily the kind of accurate model about what's going on. So um, there are both um, very small nonprofits and big nonprofits and small profit-making institutions um, and rank amateurs out there um, that collect data because uh, the common crawl um, uh, data set, which is um, uh, routinely uh, copied from everything on the internet, um, people can get access to this data. They can make uh, training uh, data sets. They can then build models. Um, And, you know, a regulation that might be sensible in respect of some large entity, uh, such as Meta um, or Google, is something that really a lot of the developers out there just don't know anything about uh, what the what the rules are. Um, and we actually want there to be competitive and new entrant 
um, model developers and training data set um, developers and a rule that says that you have to keep very, very accurate records um, about what your training data sets are and so forth um, can is just maybe impractical uh, if you actually care about the existence of a large number of people instead of just a few small companies, um, instead of a few big companies being able to participate in the um, uh, foundation model and generative AI space. Uh, another thing that um, I'm aware of, which is that a lot of generative AI systems are being developed in-house. And I don't see why if um, I'm developing a data set for an in-house use that necessarily there's the same public interest in getting access to disclosure of my training data as there would be um, if uh, it was a publicly accessible database. The other thing, uh, a third thing uh, of concern is that some of these generative AI systems are built on open source models and open source models can basically be kind of proliferated all around the internet. Um, and here's the company that might have developed, or here's the research group that might have developed the training data set way back when. And then here are all these other companies and entities and research groups that basically take that training data set and make various uh, models based on it. So, how do these people out here? who are using the data set from over here to know what kind of obligation that they have to, um, uh, to disclose um, their data. Another kind of practical consideration is that um, at least uh, many of the comments that call for disclosure of training data sets um, uh, in response to the Copyright Office Notice of Inquiry they think that actually it's really important that copyright owners be able to identify um, through this disclosure whether their data uh, was their works were used as training data and a lot of the sort of work on provenance of training data sets focuses on on the provenance of a data set not necessarily the provenance of each individual item within the training data set. So, um, uh, and I think there are uh, certainly companies that are uh, part of the space that um, uh, EU wants to regulate and that the US will be considering regulating um, the big uh, developers of, uh, of generative AI. Um, they consider that very specific information about the data on which they trained um, is a trade secret. Um, and I think it's important to understand that, you know, here's like the big initial data set that they use to try to like figure out, okay, we're gonna build a foundation model. Then you have to curate that training set um, in order to get rid of stuff that is duplicates or that is inappropriate um, hate speech or otherwise um, information that you don't want to have in your data set. And so, you know, are you supposed to disclose the, the big initial dating set, data set or the curated data set? And the curation of that data set, I think, has more claim to being a trade secret than maybe to the uh, training data set more generally. So those are a series of concerns that um, that motivate me uh, to have some reservations about uh, training data disclosure requirements. Yeah, I, I I see your point about you know it's it's nice to set a rule, but then it needs to be feasible. You need to be able to comply with it. And as you point out, maybe the big ones have you know a culture of compliance and have the people that can do it but the smaller ones uh, usually would prefer them to hire engineers rather than lawyers <laughs> to start with uh, in terms of innovation 
looking at that practical thing and at the reality of generative AI, you make an important point in your submission that um, generative AI models are generally not designed to copy uh, training data and that they are designed to learn from the data at an abstract and what you call an uncopyrightable uh, level. And, and your submission adds that the generative AI training process extracts information from millions or billions of works, as you said, that big you know, data set they start with, and in the process disassembles or tokenizes their elements to construct a very de different representation in the models. So from, from a copyright lawyer point of view, what does that mean, that, that tokenization, the fact that things are shopped in small parts, uh, when it comes to the input aspect. So I think actually a nice analogy is to Legos or Tinker Toys. So I've actually constructed this battleship in Lego box. And at some point I decide that I want to make something else besides that ba battleship. So I, I take all the bricks that were part of the battleship. And I disassemble them and then I put them in a different order and I make uh, a different kind of thing. I make, let's say the Tower of London or the Eiffel Tower. Um, so it's the same building blocks as I use to make the, the battleship, but I, put it, I, I construct them in such a different way that you can't tell from the Tower of London or the Eiffel Tower that I built with a second set of Lego blocks, I can't, you can't tell that that once was a battleship, okay? So that's, a, I think, um, a very concrete metaphor that people can use to understand that the, the process of, um, of, tokenizing as the terminology is in the generative AI space is basically really taking each word or sometimes segments of words and essentially assigning a number to them and then looking for um, essentially here's all the ones that basically kind of like our colors and here are the ones that are about um, animals, and these are the ones that are about um, about philosophy um, or about historical figures, right? The the data basically is in a certain form in the in copyright works that are part of the training data, but the model uh, does not embody the training data in a recognizable way. And, you know, it's a little hard to put your hand or head around that kind of because it's just not the way that we think about um, the component elements of copyright works. But uh, computer engineers, basically, they think of, of in copyright works as bags of words. And they don't think about it in terms of sort of the expressive elements that you and I enjoy whenever we pick up um, a novel or another well-written type of situation, type, type of work. Uh, and so, you know, for them, this is just like, of course, we're not using the expression. Why, you know, why, why should copyright people be interested in this at all? Um, so I've, you know, I've given quite a few talks to, uh, to computer scientists uh, about these issues um, recently. And they're just like baffled um, uh, about, you know, it's like, we're doing like really important science, okay? This is like really, really innovative and really creative. And we're doing something that actually is beneficial for humanity. And why are you giving me so much grief? Um, is kind of the way that some of them think. Um, yeah, so so basically, you know, it's not Harry Potter is not in its entirety in a data set, but it's small parts of the words that are in the book that end up being there. And to a certain extent, the 
process of learning is like, it's not the same, but it's when painters in the Renaissance would, would go and look at statues and just train on hands and fingers, because that's one of the most difficult things to draw, or just do hands, hands, hands. You know, it's not that they're looking at David or whatever, they're just trying to understand how to draw a hand to a certain extent. Well, there there is a kind of danger in anthropomorphizing, right? Mm. That um, uh, this kind of learning and understanding um, and even training, um, uh, those words uh, are, are words that humans use as to mm -hmm. what we humans do. And, you know, for some of the people who are really critical of generative AI, they say, no anthropomorphizing, you can't do it. Well, we have to, you know, we have to have some mental concepts that we can um, use to comprehend what the phenomena is that involves the model development and learning and training and understanding are our words that we understand that we project onto the foundation models because we don't have words to describe what's going on without those kinds of analogies. So I think it's important to sort of recognize that they're analogies um, and not the truth. Um, it's important to sort of understand that the what's going on inside of the models is something that humans are having a difficult time explaining. And, you know, maybe, maybe explainability will get better over time, uh, but the way that these machine learning systems process information is kind of through a set of levels of the neural networks. And that's a very efficient, apparently, way of uh, essentially um, enabling the prediction of this user just put in this particular prompt. And based on the data that I have in my system, these are the words or these are the images or these are the other outputs that I, that I the model, predict will satisfy the, the, kind of the user's um, query. So these are mostly prediction machines right now. Um, they kind of predict that if you, you know, if you have these words in sequence, um, that the next word is likely to be dog. Um, so, so, so we've looked um, at the input uh, side of your um, submission, but looking now at the output uh, side of generative AI, um, you state in the submission that the fact that generative AI can now make works that are good enough to pass as human created is impressive, but it is also beside the point. And you then detail why the idea that an AI could or should be recognized as the author of a work is problematic, while also highlighting that there are cases, uh, specific cases where prompts could be detailed enough to meet the threshold of authorship. So can you, can you clarify what we should understand behind those statements about authorship and AI? Well, one thing that's actually interesting is that in 1985, I actually wrote an article about uh, allocating ownership rights in computer-generated works. And at the time that I wrote that paper, um, there was a very lively but small debate about um, uh, who should own copyright in computer-generated works. And I basically said, Look, as a practical matter, it makes more sense for the person who used the generative AI system to um, produce this particular output to own the rights, if any rights should be attached to it, because they're the ones who, number one, generated it. They're in possession. Um, they 
let's say they generated a bunch of different things and you know they says you know this one actually has some uh has some like you know has some has some thing that I like and that I think other people might like. So I'm going to choose this one and then I'm going to modify a little bit, you know, maybe edit out some things and put in a few other things. Um, and, and, and so I'm best situated. I mean, the programmer who wrote the, the program that caused the thing to happen, they couldn't recognize it. And the copyright office can't tell the difference right now between AI generated and non AI generated stuff. So, you know, what's the big deal? Now, um, the big deal is that the Supreme Court um, uh, in the early 1990s um, said that creativity, by which they meant creativity by a human being, is a necessary ingredient for copyright protection to be given to um, a work. Um, and so that is the basis on which the Copyright Office has, uh, has said, you know, there's no human creativity, therefore there's no human originality, therefore there's no uh, copyright in the output of these generated systems. Now, again, I think in principle, the Copyright Office um, kind of understands that there may be some situations in which there's a kind of iterative process back and forth, back and forth between the model that's generating outputs and me, the human creator saying, no, take out this part and take out that part and put in this part and put in that part. And there's enough then human um, engagement in the creative process so that you can basically identify kind of elements of the outputs that actually um, look enough like or sound enough like or read enough like something that a human actually was a participant in the creation of um, to be eligible for copyright. That being said, the Copyright Office so far has been pretty strict um, about refusing registration to works, even when there's been a kind of iterative process. Um, and so I think it remains to be seen whether the office or the courts in the EU uh, decide that this level of engagement between the user and the model is sufficient to show that kind of um, your own intellectual creation right? A lot of times um, artists and others use um, assistance to aid them in the development of, uh, of their kind of achieving their vision. Um, and if you kind of think of generative AI systems as tools for human creation, then it would make sense that at some point the use of the tool um, in service of my vision would actually be something that I could claim copyright in. But we haven't seen the Copyright Office in the US um, issue registration certificates to any of the generative AI outputs. But I noticed actually that the Motion Picture Association um, comment kind of says, please don't be so rigid uh, because of course, Hollywood has been using um, computer generated stuff in its movies, right? The, a lot of the movies where somebody ages or de-ages or, um, or during stunts um, or in um, the kind of like animation of Beauty and the Beast or the like, uh, there are lots of computer generated things in movies. And the mo movie people don't wanna have to disclaim, oh, this special effect or this particular de-aging thing is something that the computer generated, therefore it's not part of our original creation and therefore is not copyright protected and therefore somebody can steal it. Um, so 
um, I think it'll be really interesting to see um, how the Copyright Office decides to respond to the motion picture industry concerns. And I, I think maybe part of that stems from the fact that you can't really isolate AI from computer generated, as you said. That's I mean, right. it's, it's, it's just the definition does not allow you to just create an island for chat GPT, right. which seems to be what in Europe we're trying to do to a certain extent and failing. Um, so looking um, at, at, at another element that was raised in the consultation uh, by the US uh, Copyright Office, which is licensing of AI input, um, your submission states that it is important to note that legally mandated collective licensing faces a difficulty in the AI context um, because uh, it differentiates collective licensing for AI from the use of the mechanism in any other field. So basically what you state is it will be impossible under current technologies to calibrate payments made under a collective licensing arrangement to actual usage of individual authors' works. And it goes back to your idea of you know, a big data set, a curated data set, tokenization, not being sure um, you know, which part of the input actually ends up in the output and in the predictive uh, approach of, of AI. So could you explain what's at stake here? Because there's quite a bit of input that came to that consultation talking about licensing and, and collective licensing. Well, I think that there are quite a few owners of large data sets that are interested in licensing works in their collection to generative AI companies. And OpenAI has made quite a few voluntary licensing arrangements uh, with some um, holders of, uh, so OpenAI, for example, has a, has a deal with uh, Shutterkot um, uh, to allow the use of images from uh, its database of, uh, of images, uh, mostly photographs, I think. And, you know, great if that, um, if a voluntary licensing regime um, works for those entities to, um, uh, as a private matter, I think that's fine. Um, I think the, the kind of the mandate that everything be licensed um, is something that is kind of unrealistic. Um, and I understand that Europeans who have um, had collective licenses um, in their experience uh, within copyright works uh, makes a lot of sense um, to them uh, because there's much less collective licensing in the US uh, than in the EU. I think it's a more foreign concept uh, for us. But let me give you some examples of why I think this is um, not such an easy thing to do even for the EU, right? So when it comes to a lot of the collective licenses, let's say um, making copies of, uh, photocopies of um, book chapters, articles, et cetera, okay? There are collective licenses um, uh, that allow people to make those copies and they just have to uh, provide some remuneration for it. Well, that's only, for this kind of work, for this kind of author, um, and um, and only then for the people who have signed up with, for the, with the collecting society um, do they typically get any kind of compensation. Um, uh, but what you have is a licensing regime which is based on the exploitation of the of the copyright through acts of reproduction. When it comes to training data, most of the training data is stuff that's out on the internet. Stuff that's out on the internet has been copied by Common Crawl and search engines and other entities for I think 17 years without any kind of issue being raised whatsoever. And now all of a sudden, ooh, um, uh, you have to get a license to do something. 
where the information is like out there in the internet um, uh, and available for free. So we don't, I think, you know, there have been times uh, where uh, people have tried to use different theories about um, copying stuff on the internet. Uh, so one theory was trespass to computer, right? If I have certain data on a computer and you come in and you copy stuff off my computer, then you're using my computing resources and I didn't give you permission to do that. So that's a trespass to um, my computer resources. And while there were one or two cases that thought that was a pretty good theory, most of the cases just said, that's really dumb. Uh, that's a really bad theory. Um, uh, another theory has been um, that, you know, the, that when you put stuff up on the internet, you authorize people to use it for uh, certain purposes and not for others. But, you know, when, it, when you're doing kind of common crawl, you can't tell, you know, what you, you know, what the, what common crawl and other entities that basically uh, crawl the web know is that if there isn't a robots txt um, uh, header that says don't don't index this then you know it's okay to do so also there's this problem of changing uh, changing things uh, changing the rules kind of like now, okay, so yesterday, this was completely legal. And today, oh, we decided copyright um, uh, makes this uh, illegal. Well, like, it was like legal for like 16 or 17 years. And all of a sudden, we decide to make it illegal. Really? Um, that sort of seems a little weird. Um, another thing that, you know, the collective license idea doesn't really pay attention to uh, is that we're talking about billions of works. We're talking about billions of authors. We're talking about um, about a lot of things that essentially have no commercial value. But how is some collecting society supposed to figure out? You know, here's twenty five cents to you. Here's thirty five cents to you. Here's a nickel to you. Um, There's just no metric, right? Um, and it seems to me that, you know, also if you kind of think, well, this will get, this will mean that authors will be able to like, you know, continue to make a living. It's like, we're talking about really small change here in terms of each author uh, entitlement. It's not like you're going to get $10,000 a year or $50,000 a year from open AI um, because they trained on your novel um, uh, five years ago, it's just not going to happen. Um, so it's, you know, the kind of the metrics um, are really very, very problematic here. Um, also, you know, the there are certain models that are retrained on a, on a periodic basis, but many of the models that are out there are ones where here's the training data set, here's the model. Once I've trained the model, I don't use the data set anymore, right? So it's a kind of, if, if what you're trying to do is a collective license for the training data, well, okay, here's 25 cents for the use of your work as training data but the model doesn't contain the training data, okay? So you'd have to kind of come up with another theory about how do you get money from the maker of the model, given that the training data set over here may not actually be a commercial entity. Now, it may be, but it may not be. You just don't know. And also, I'm the person who developed the model, but somebody else actually developed the training data set. So the kind of like figuring out all of the metrics and also most of the kind of collecting, uh, collective licensing things in the past have been, here's the collecting society for authors of literary works. 
and here's a collecting society for music, and here's a collecting society for images. Okay, we're talking about every type of data. We're not talking about one type of data. And so, you know, I can imagine all the collecting societies are say, well, me, 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 I'll, I'm happy to take money and give it away. Um, but I don't see how it's really feasible to do that. So um, again, practical difficulties. I kind of understand the, the, the rationale for it and I have some sympathy for it. I just think that it's so impractical that it's just not, not really feasible. And, you know, I'm, I'm an American, so feasibility and like, does it work in the world um, actually matters to me. Well, well as, as a European, I, I'd like to say, we, we also like feasibility <laughs> and, and probably our concern, me being a Belgian, um, is probably, um, you're talking about 25 cents how much of that will stay in the pocket of the collecting society before it's even issued? Oh, no, this, there's no question the collecting societies would basically be the big beneficiaries of this, not the authors. Yeah, I mean, um, it, it, it's not a, an oddity that most of the big internet cases in Europe start with SABAM, which is the Belgian collecting society. So we have a certain fondness for them creating um, uh, fundamental rights principles through courts. <laughs> Um, well, I mean, thank you so much for, for um, the great submission that you wrote, uh, because I think it was very useful for us, not just from a U.S. perspective, but just because you raise all of these practical aspects which relate to the, the reality of AI to a certain extent and not the, the myth or the perception of AI that some people may have. And, um, you know, we, we have a, a, a political agreement on the AI Act in Europe. There is some language on copyright in it that relates to transparency, but it seems it's it's not completely impractical. It seems to be a, a rather blanket umbrella um, transparency and, and making sure that you comply with the rules, which you would imagine people would do not just with copyright, hopefully, <laughs> but with all the rules. Um, but I'm, I'm sure that you will have food for thought on, on the final text of the AI Act once we go beyond the political um, uh, agreement and look forward to reading you, reading your colleagues and um, seeing how this evolves. But um, yes, please, thank you. Keep on bringing the analogies of legal blocks and, and, and things like that, because I think it's very important for people to understand how this functions in practice and maybe remove some of the legitimate fears, as you said, that, that authors may have um, about their value in the future and how their creativity will be valued. Um, I, I think there is still a lot of room for creativity and for creators. Absolutely. Um, and, and I think, you know, um, as you mentioned, there were computer generated um, 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 creations have been there and have been there for a long time. You know, in music industry, it's been used a lot in CGI in, in, in Hollywood. I'm sure in the future, we will see that artificial intelligence will be a useful tool for creators. Right. I certainly hope so. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time, Professor Sam. Okay. And uh, keep on giving us uh, your, your thoughts. We, we certainly appreciate them. Okay. Thanks very much.